Brown and Paul Mueller. Mueller, thank you. Yeah. Uh, before I jump into bios, if you have your CEU form, please drop them on the back table. Um, I'm going to stand up and the presentation and try to organize that alphabetically. You can grab it on your way out. Um, so Kirsten Lee manages MWH's commissioning and startup group, which includes process mechanical, INC integration, electrical and treatment process, process specialties. Kirsten's education and background is in hydraulics and water and wastewater treatment, and she has 11 years of experience in the water and wastewater industry. Uh, Fred Brown is an engineer for the city of Spokane at the Riverside Park Water Reclamation Facility. Fred has over 26 years of experience in the industry and is a licensed wastewater operator. And our third speaker today, uh, Paul, will be calling in via Hopefully. phone. He hasn't answered the last two times. So okay, let's <laughs> keep it in this chain. Um, Paul is a principal process engineer with Jacobs Engineering in Corvallis, Oregon. Uh, with over 32 years of experience, he specializes in water and wastewater treatment process design and analysis with a special emphasis on membrane treatment processes. So with that, I'll hand it over to our speakers. Thank you. So we're gonna double team this, Fred and I, and then um, hopefully our process expert, Paul calls in folks have questions about the, the actual process. Um, for those who got to go to the tour, this is about the Spokane plant that just got went online big in that facility. So um, I always try to come up with cute titles because then hopefully you get tur good turnout. Um, one of the things about this project was it was the largest installation that Paul uh, Water had ever done for the membrane type. Um, we did a full system integration. So those folks who are IMC folks can appreciate the anxiety that that brings to a commissioning person. And it was the first of its kind. So it, we're, we wanted to share a lot of the lessons learned associated with it, um, especially for folks who are looking at um, membrane systems. So high level and then we're gonna talk about the project. Fred's gonna give you the rundown of the project and, and the components of the plant for those who haven't um, been out to visit. Um, we'll talk about the, the planning behind it, the commissioning. I would definitely give, give kudos to Jacobs. They did a really excellent job in the planning of how we were gonna start the plant up. And then I think what most people want to talk about, lessons learned, right? That's one of the first things people ask me as a commissioning manager, um, you know, about the different technology. So I'll start with the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, I only get had time for a handful of them. So if you'd like them to hear more, I'm happy to share them. And then um, commissioning startups and best practices and project weeks. So with that, you want to go, Fred? So if you notice, she didn't even speak into the microphone, but I'm going to try to conserve my voice after the tour this morning. Um, so yes, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would say that uh, I've been working at the treatment plants uh, off and on since uh, 04. And this is without a doubt the largest project and the most expensive that we've uh, undertaken. So very exciting. And I can say that um, after a year, it's been about a year of full-time operation of the membrane facility. I can say that it's been a success. So we're, we're very pleased with how things uh, finished up. So going into a little bit of uh, project background, yes, the, the project did take uh, almost six years and represents a lot of work on a lot of different parts, uh, city staff, uh, contractors and designers and, um, about uh, just under $200 million in total for the project. And um, just, just a lot of work uh, getting to where we are right now. And we're definitely uh, meeting the limits that um, are required by ecology. Going a little more into the plant, um, just uh, at this point in time, we're averaging in the low 30s for our, our flow. We are a combined system. And so when it rains in the downtown corridor of Spokane, um, we can see flows jumping up well over 100 MGD, which poses a, a, a problem or a, a challenge, I'll say. Um, here's our plant uh, from an aerial view. And uh, I'll just say that this area right here was, um, right here was the original plant back in the 50s. And since then, we've, uh, you know, in the 70s, we expanded to secondary treatment and um, additional uh, disinfection. And then since the mid to late 90s, 
<clears throat> we have been under construction until uh, last year. So <laughs> we don't know what it's like to not be under construction. It, it's, uh, it's kind of a relief now that things have calmed down and we can actually uh, get down to business. Um, just, just a basic outline of the plant. There's our headworks right there where we have uh, some six millimeter um, perforated plates for screening. Um, we have uh, five primary clarifiers total. We, we don't need all five. And so we end up using our fifth one often as a storm, um, storm um, uh, containment, uh, just extra storage. Uh, these are our aeration basins. We have five of those. And um, <clears throat> they're each uh, 3 million gallons with our newest over here at 4 million gallons. Here's our secondary clarifiers. Again, we don't need all of them. We use uh, four habitually. We have a fifth clarifier that um, we also use for uh, storm storage uh, as well as a, a, a storm clarifier right here. It's nice having a fifth clarifier for when um, we have to take one down for maintenance or something. Here's our chlorine contact basins. And that's our discharge point uh, into the Spokane River. We also have some support structures. Um, well, well, I'll get into the distribution box as we go further into our membrane facility and, and its layout. <clears throat> um, and again, I'll go into a little bit further on, on some of these areas, like our membrane uh, pretreatment area, the facility itself. Um, here's our, our chemical storage building. Uh, the challenge with uh, running membranes is they require uh, constant cleaning in order to keep performance where they're supposed to be. And that requires uh, chemicals. So we needed uh, a lot more chemicals than we were used to. And so we had uh, this facility put in at the same time that the membranes went in. Uh, the, you know, some of the, some of the why we went about uh, doing this project, um, as you can see here, this is further downstream in the area called uh, Lake Spokane, and it, uh, it's tendency for uh, algae blooms. And so we were removing phosphorus at a 90% roughly uh, level, and now with the membranes online, we're at, uh, we're at about 99.6%. So doing a lot better. Um, the water that we create, uh, uh, one, one bonus is uh, it's useful for many other things in the future should we uh, go that route. It's a good picture of somebody uh, fishing at our outfall. <laughs> oh, there we go. It is a... Uh, well, Little known secret that that's where the biggest fish are. <laughs> okay, so leading into the membrane facility, uh, we needed to capture the secondary effluent, which uh, used to go into the chlorine contact basins. Now we need to grab it and uh, send it to the membrane facility. And so this was part of that design in the project where the, um, the water is now piped across the chlorine contact basins and over to the membrane facility. Um, from uh, going across the um, chlorine contact basins, flow goes into this area here. This is our distribution box and flow from here gets screened and pumped to the membranes. Um, one, one concern that we had um, up until this point, we've, we've been lucky enough that all of our liquids flow by gravity. And uh, this is the first time that we were going to need to pump our liquids, uh, which is into the membranes. And so uh, we had a concern, what do we do during a power outage? Where does our flow go? And so that was the idea behind this distribution box. So normally it's, it's in this chamber and it's getting pumped into the membrane facility. 
should the, the pumps fail or you know we, we have a problem, this area just fills up, goes over the weir, and then flows into the uh, disinfection uh, facility. So uh, that was a that was a great design solution that uh, Jacobs came came up with. From that distribution box, uh, the flow is sent to um, uh, we have dr uh, fine drum screens. It's at a it's at about a 500 micron uh, filter uh, level. Um, they're about 18 foot in diameter, very large, and uh, this is a picture of them in construction. Now that it's complete, everything's covered, so it's not much to see. So this is a, a good shot of what we had to put in. Once uh, passing through the fine screens, um, it's uh, flow is introduced, our alum is introduced to the flow in a rapid uh, mixing zone and then flows into a larger uh, flocculation zone where we add, um, back here, we've, we've added uh, alum to assist with flocculation. Uh, from the flocculation zone, it goes into the uh, feed channel for the membrane feed pumps. You can see the suction side of all of the pumps that are in the building. There's um, basically the, the whole design is, is um, focused around two different sides so that if we if we lose some capacity, we, we still retain the, the rest of it. So this area feeds half of the membranes and then over in this area, not seen in the picture, uh, feeds the other half. A lot of redundancy <laughs> built into uh, this system. So there's, uh, these are our feed pumps. There's six per train. I'll go into the layout of the membranes themselves, but uh, um, six per train, um, not all of them are going at once. It just depends on uh, flow levels. Here's our uh, membrane racks. And this is the, the Paul Corporation design. These are the membrane canisters. I think there's a picture of, there we go. So that's a cut view of the, the membrane modules themselves. And there's a couple of uh, membranes in each module. <laughs> I don't know how many of us, there's many in there. <clears throat> we have um, two entire trains and each train holds eight racks. And in total, we have uh, 4,608 modules. Uh, that provides a design flow of 50 million gallons a day. And um, we do have the ability to um, up that to about 75 million gallons a day for 12 hours at a time. But, <clears throat> so that's kind of the, the basic layout of the membrane facility and uh, we'll venture into commissioning of the project. So as I said, um, I would I want to give kudos to Jacobs because they did a really great job um, with the pre-planning effort during during uh, during design. So they built eight commissioning modes, and I'm not going to go into each every one of them. But one of the things I wanted to highlight were some of the key, the key things that I think made it a big success in, in how we started up the plant. Um, they identified these temporary bypass connections, and I have a slide for the ones that I like the best. Um, they also were, because it was incorporated to design, we were able to bid it in our construction, put it in our bed, and they didn't have any surprises about what that was going to look like later down the line. So that was a really big benefit. And then um, Fred touched on this diversion structure, but um, it was really important not only to final design of how the plant was going to operate, but it also supported the, these multiple interim operations that we did throughout startup. And I'll talk about that. Um, this is a really sweet video right before we turn the plan on. Um, obviously, everybody was really excited to have the water come across. We're finally feeding secondary effluent into the diversion structure. I mean, you guys have all been there when you turn plants on. It's, you, you know, 10 people standing there watching this water go over. Um, and what was really cool is uh, it's actually a very beautiful water feature that we never want to happen because that means that you're overflowing it. But um, when it does happen, it's really pretty. And it's this nice, beautiful um, spill over this weir. And you can kind of see it just about to crest. Um, and this is what it would look like in an overflow situation. As Fred was saying, the power outage overfills and, and goes up um, into this bypass channel, which then would go into the uh, the forming contact basins. So I'll just let you guys see the spill because it is, you know, 
hopefully nobody ever sees it in the in the future because that that's not a good sign. Yeah, now that we're operational, we don't want to see that. Yeah, <laughs> it was pretty neat. So it was a great day. You see everybody who's out there ready for ready for the activity. So um, one of the main bypasses, and for those who got to see the tour, this was actually in the pump room. And you looked at it, you could see that this was all blind plan and shock, but this temporary pipe um, enabled us to do a complete testing of our flash flock. Uh, we were able to dose alum and, and tune our alum system prior to us ever sending water out uh, of the facility. It was able to run at a big uh, uh, racetrack. Um, and also let us test our MS pumps, right? I was able to do entire pump curves, system curves without ever sending water anywhere outside of this, this facility. So it was a great, great implementation for the design. Um, there's also a couple other temporary connections um, that they put in uh, for the clean and plate systems, as well as um, off the backwash pump station, all to help me facilitate starting these pump stations off uh, without having to send water out of this building. So it was all very self-contained. It was kind of like my own little island. Didn't really bug the plant guys too much. I tried not to, but it was great, great implementation. Um, one of the things I'll talk about is uh, best practices, these commissioning startup workflows, and I'll kind of talk about it a little bit later, but Jacobs did include this. I think one of the things that we all, as engineers, and I'm an engineer um, from a previous life, is we write these div one specs, and you think, like, you spend so much time doing it, you think it makes sense, and then you give it to somebody else, and they interpret it, and you're like, no, right? You know, the inputs, the outputs, it doesn't quite match. And so by developing these workflows really early on in the project, so we're all really clear about the expectations of what is the step to get us to substantial? What is the step to introduce chemicals? This is a best practice that our team implements on every project. And um, I think it's a, a great way for our teams to communicate. All right, what everybody's here for, lessons learned. So membrane insulation, I think Fred said how many, 4,000? 4,608. 4,608 of these individual modules got installed into these racks. And um, one of the things that we found after the racks were installed was we had foaming. Um, nobody anticipated the foam. Nobody knew why the foam was happening. And after we started flushing the membranes, we found, hey, that handy dandy lubricant that we used where it says, when in doubt, over apply, was actually a surfactant. And when you're flushing it with a high pressure water, you're exasperating the issue and you're causing foam coming out of all places you don't want foam. So um, great lesson learned when you guys are looking at installing these membranes. Um, look at what type of lubricant your manufacturer recommends um, and be, be cognizant of that. Some good things that we actually did, is we have the men on spike in this activity. You can see him as one of our vendors here. He's training our guys on how to do it. That was a really good positive lesson learned. Um, we did actually do heat frog crews, so we two separate dedicated crews to install these membranes, which I think was a great um, use of the time, right? We didn't have people sitting around waiting. Uh, but as a result, you guys can imagine custom sets of tools. <laughs> Manufacturers only usually send you one custom set of tools. So we actually asked for a second set, and that enabled us to install the membranes in a lot more time and fashion. Um, I'm a big fan of videos because I don't think I can ever explain that water and the 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 Both of these pumps are, well, we had multiple pumps that were across the line or uh, basically on starters. They were not on soft starters, they were not on VFDs. And we had multiple pumping systems that were like this. And I think at a root of it, um, Paul typically does a much smaller scale. So when you scaled up, they scaled up the pumps. And when they scaled up the pumps, we probably should have looked at putting things on, on soft starts or putting things on VFDs, and it would have helped a lot with this water hammer effect that we saw during startup. Um, so one thing that we ended up doing is, fortunately, for the membrane system, we were able to correct it with programming adjustments, um, how we adjusted valves opening, how the pumps were sequenced when they started, and having a nice lag between the two um, coming on or off. There was also a pumping system that was outside of the Paul system uh, that was on the drum screen spray bar. So drum screens are on me, right? When they get clogged up, you have to clean them. And there's spray bar pumps that come on and clean those spray and clean the drum screens off. Those also <laughs> were on starters. And that one actually, we weren't able to correct with um, programming or valve adjustments. And we, uh, you guys just installed the VFDs last week. Just put them in and everything's running fine now. 
As a result of it, they replaced that piping how many times? Five. Five times. So this actually happened. This is a pipe break. You can see this large HTP pipe. For those who can't see it that well, you can see that the alignment kind of uh, sideways. But this happened on the call system. So we were doing startup. The water hammer was so severe, it completely fractured um, at this connection. This is the next one. After we thought we addressed the foaming issue, uh, we were in operation, we we're running the memory, we we're tuning a uh, clean and play system, and we start having more foaming. And you can kind of see um, the volume's not on, but you're, it's me talking, which was another reason I muted it. Um, but you also hear the engineer standing next to me, and all of a sudden, we're like, oh my God. <laughs> I'm thinking it's this nice, slow, like foamy thing happening. And then all of a sudden, it is like geyser situation. This containment area is filling up. Paul and I are sitting there like, oh my God, this is not what we. So, yeah, very uh, eventful uh, to say the least. Um, so, we had foaming not only during the installation, but we had foaming post startup when we were trying to optimize the chemicals. So, I had an opportunity to talk to um, the operators this morning. This, this problem has persisted for a year. And Paul uh, Water, who, you know, the, uh, the vendor couldn't figure it out. Um, our engineer was very collaborative, but we couldn't figure out the root cause. And ultimately, I think that through operations, they have found, finally found the correlation of what was causing it. And it sounds, based on observations, um, the memories are scaling. And so what was happening is they're having um, they dose alum in two different, two different places, two different places, and the aluminum was adhering to the, to the membranes and scanning. And so when they were trying to remove the aluminum during the CIP, it wasn't, it wasn't getting scrubbed off. So the aluminum was reacting with the hypochlorite, causing this massive foaming event. And so what they've had to do is they've adjusted the recipes. They, City of Spokane themselves, this is why operators are so critical to me. The, the operators are the ones that found the solution through trial and error and spending the time and understanding correlations. And they figured it out that the root cause was the scaling was not going away with the recipes that the vendor supplied. They came up with their own recipe and fixed this. So kudos to operators. I know there's a couple operators here, but I will always say operators are the, are the ones that are gonna figure it out. So what they've adjusted is they now use a strong acid to um, remove the scaling off of the membranes Previously, they had been using citric acid versus sulfuric. Um, some of the things that exasperated this issue, uh, for those who actually went and looked at the job site, it's a very small footprint. If you think about the amount of equipment in that building, right? The memory is on the kind of the main floor. And in the basement, you have all the chemical dosing systems as well as the CIP systems. So when the memory is going to a cleaning cycle, all that water gets pushed up in these headers and then drops 40 feet. So you imagine you're already having a foaming issue. And then you have a pumping that's like forcing this foam down and it's just causing more and more, more foam creating. So it would definitely um, contribute to the issue, but it was not the root cause. Another fun video for those of you who actually want to go out there and look at it. Um, we have the version of the structure. And one of those challenges that we did in the structure is that we had to convey all that food uh, water out of the building drop it down and this actually goes below further and this pipe is sized for build out so if they were to expand the ms facility this pipe would still su would supply that the final design so it is oversized for the current facility today and as a result we have an open channel situation going on inside this pipe i always i almost wish it was clear because it'd be a beautiful water feature right you'd have this waterfall effects dropping down but that's what's happening. You have this waterfall effect in this giant pipe and it's causing air entrapment in the bottom and then ultimately burping in the header. Um, unfortunately, there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, we've done, the city's done some mitigations. We put some grading down to kind of break up the, the yeah. splash, but it still splashes. So. Right. Is there a pipe up for your line and pull the air out? Yeah. It's actually open. Um, it's vented see, on the top. It has a huge vent on the top, yeah. So lessons learned, there's, I combined a couple of them. Impacts the existing systems. Um, I would say again, when I went through this with Jacobs, they were very open to talking to us about like, hey, this is something that, you know, we could have done better. And I would always applaud engineers to have that, to have that um, 
I guess, openness. So there's two main systems that uh, or existing systems that tied into the MF facility was our plant water system as well, which is um, which is potable water. And then they have a natural gas system. Um, both systems, we had uh, challenges with startup. And ultimately, the plant water system um, was pulling an instant too much of an instantaneous flow. So the plant water supply is everywhere else on the plant. And as soon as we were pulling that slush water, we were faulting out into grass. We were starving the rest of the system. The frustrating aspect is, is that we actually upgraded the PW2 system as part of this project, but we didn't upgrade it enough. So now the plant's going to go have to go back and add another pump. We'll add one more pump. Because they, we ultimately lost the redundancy. So it has to be full. We have to use all the, pipe, the pumps to maintain um, PW2 throughout, uh, to maintain all of the, the systems that are on them. Um, natural gas, uh, again, I, I'm a civil engineer, so I feel like I can pick on civil engineers. I would never design a compressible fluid pipeline. <laughs> I feel like nine times out of 10, when I go to plants and we have issues with natural gas lines, it's, we just don't truly design them well enough to understand how natural gas flows or how gas flows through systems. We want to treat it like a water system. And as a result, we end up with designs that have to be modified in the field. Um, fortunately, this was a very easy fix for us. All we had to do is move the PRV closer to the point of ejection. And we were able to get the flow through the pipe um, and provide the, this is a hot water system uh, to be able to maintain online. Uh, but when I asked Paul, Mueller with Jacobs, hey, what was the lesson learned? How, how would we fix this in the future? And he said, you know, when we first start these designs, all we do is look at capacities. You know, will the capacity meet the demand? And he goes, and rarely do we ever go back and check it after we've gone through the design. So he said, lesson learned, Pearson, like, if I were to do it again, that's what I would do. Flow continuity. Uh, I think this is another one that commonly happens when we do startups. Uh, when we're looking at how pumping systems, how they have to be tuned, how we have to optimize these pumping systems and look at making sure things aren't cycling on and off. Um, so we actually had a couple of examples of it. The one I want to talk most about is the strung screens, which again, this is, these are the pumps that we ended up breaking the pipe five times. And you can imagine when you have the cycling issue, how that might exasperate the issue. Um, so ultimately what happened was um, we were looking at the flow control loops, the control narrative per the engineer had a very specific way we were supposed to operate the drum screens. Wasn't wrong, it's just when you actually put the system online, it created a lot of issues with the pumping systems and it caused the pumping to come on and off, especially when the, when the drum screens got um, clogged. So what we did is we worked with the engineer, we modified the control strategy, right? We completely changed how the drum screens were supposed to operate. And we were able to adjust this and fix this cycling on and off. Um, and really, you know, um, level out that, that operation for those pumps. I have a lot of lessons to learn about system integration. I probably could have done a whole presentation on this alone. I threw up all of, the, all of the challenges and I just wanted to maybe focus on one per slide. So that's kind of what I put the blue in, the blue bowl. Um, the plant went through not only a, this huge upgrade as Fred said, they've been under construction since the 90s, but they also did a full state upgrade not only for the MF facility, but their entire plant. Um, and this was over a period of two years, I think, Paul, uh, Joe said. So two years, they completely changed their graphics. They updated their PLCs. They replaced um, dry. I mean, it was just a full gut of their system. It was a massive effort. And through this, we were also asking a vendor who um, maybe wasn't familiar with these graphics. You know, I'm not sure how many folks have actually seen these, these high performance graphics. Um, this, this black and gray scale, um, but we're asking a vendor to replicate their graphics, their, you know, I wouldn't say proprietary, but their homegrown graphics and match them to a plant standard. And when you're talking about a, maybe a medium sized vendor who has two integrators on staff to completely modify every graphic that's associated with their plant and also match it to a standard that's in development in the middle of it, you can imagine how many, um, these we had throughout the project. It's not my problem, it's somebody else's problem. So um, the root cause or the challenge that we had was replicating the vendor's bed, or the plant's graphics. The root cause of the issue that we had is, like I said, the vendor was ultimately understaffed. They didn't really understand the scope of work. And um, in the middle of it, our integrator was developing their standard, right? So we didn't have like a book to hand to, to Paul and say, do this. 
And I think if we had, um, I think a lot of that, that finger pointing would have gone away. So that was the root cause. And then when you talk about lessons learned, um, I would always say when you're looking at who do we assign scope to, it should be assigned to the person who's probably best suited to do it. And in this situation, in my, in my opinion, it would have been our integrator. Our integrator knew our standards. The integrator was already doing it. We should have just said, hey, here's Paul's graphics, go replicate it, right? Like, it would have saved everybody a lot of headache. Um, I think Paul, Paul Water probably won't answer a call from me for a long time because I task force the heck out of them to make sure it got done. Um, commission you started best practices and project wins. So um, throughout the project life cycle, I'm just gonna click through this because of time. There's a lot of good best practices and things that I, I talk about with owners about how can you make your projects successful? Um, and for me, I, we do hard bid. Um, I'm a big proponent of alternative delivery because I'm much more of a collaborator. I think Fred would attest to that, maybe overly communicate in some situations. Um, but it, it starts at pre-construction. I told you like Jacobs did a really great job in incorporating commissioning and started during pre-construction. And I would always advocate for that. I hate when people call me at 50% and they're like, hey, we wanna start our plan up. Can you rent me some plans? Like, no, guys, come on, let's, let's have some planning. So, yeah. So I'd always advocate, let's let's start during pre-construction, let's make some smart choices and get that stuff incorporated into the design. Um, one thing I didn't want to just say, like, don't be shy to, to push our vendors. I I really had to push Paul um, to make sure that they stayed on on time, on, on target, and then we met what the plant needed. And you know, no fault of loan, the plant was a great success, but the vendor just needed some help. And this also goes back to being a collaborator, working with your vendors, whoever it is, your whoever stakeholder, and helping them get across the line. And we did that over and over and over again with them to make sure they were successful. Project wins. Another thing I always talk to owners about: the day you can give me an operator is never too soon. You want me to leave at the end of the day. You don't want to be holding on to me and being like, "Don't leave. I don't feel comfortable running my plant." If you can give me an operator, I will train them from day one and teach them how to start up your plant. And so when I leave, they're pushing me out the door. That's what I want. I want them pushing me out the door saying like, it's my plan, I'm ready to take it over. We did that really well in Spokane. They gave me an operator from day one. Um, I had two dedicated operators. They were out with me every single day, starting up equipment, going through lessons learned, doing functional test plans. And we had a completely seamless handoff. And it was, um, it was great. And I, I got to go out and talk to them again. And, and the relationships you build during at this level is, is wonderful. Um, they also employed train a trainer. Like I said, I had, I had two dedicated operators for me. And those guys then trained their staff, which was a great way to get the plan. Um, as, as Fred said, this was just immediate, um, some, some um, data from the very short first turn on the plan. But I, what I wanted to show is for those who maybe didn't go out and edge the video person and see how clear the effluent is. This, you can see this is the filtrate coming off of the, um, the membrane facility. And then because it's a flood flow system, the further I walk down, you can see how murky the water previous is. The plant has a lot of really historical guys who've been there for 20, 30 years. And these guys were out there hands on the bar, staring at the plant. They seem to be Like these guys have been there for 30 years and they were just gobsmacked on how, how clear, clear the one was. And last but not least, safety is a huge component for contractors. Um, we had over 500 days without incident. incident um, and I would want to give the slating crew a big kudos for that because it's a lot of work, a lot of man hours, and we did it without um, any incident or injury. All right. I think I'm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I love the lessons learned always. Um, do we have about five minutes for questions? If there's folks uh, attending virtually, please type them in the chat. And if anybody in the room wants to kick it off. Oh, question. Uh, you oh. covered all the bases. It was airtight. Oh, right behind me. So when did you start and how often did you have meetings with the contractor and everybody, you know, the vendors and the whole nine yards, your commissioning meetings? Um, so there was a whole bunch of upgrades we did with the plant over the five years. There was a lot of work that was prior to the MF facility. 
So I had week or monthly meetings with them for almost four years. And then as we ramped, the meetings became weekly and then daily and, you know, and that into that level. So uh, we definitely ramp as work increases. Um, and then when we got into operations, I was going up into the operator room every morning and we were having it like an operator come in down, um, hand off every morning. So um, that happened. And then with our vendor, um, they got they got task force pretty early uh, with me. And so I was meeting with them on a daily basis, if not twice a day, to make sure they stayed on track. Yeah. That morning meeting was, was key to success. You never know who you're going to get each day, you know, on the cruise. So right. getting all in sync first thing in the morning, that was, that was a big one. You might have mentioned this. Um, how long do you think this plant will be able to sustain the areas servicing? Like that's what's a, the capacity? That's Ooh. a good question. You know, at 80% at, uh, capacity, we need to, uh, and, and, we're getting close, but I, I think we got a solid 10, 20 years. Okay. And to follow up on that, how would you scale it for the future? Like, is there space to so expand it? It's very tight right now in, in the, uh, the plant uh, property. Mm -hmm. um, we have a little bit left to the east side, and we have the ability to tack on another uh, train if we need to. Thanks. Thank you, Fred. Um, with the future, the, the additional capacity in the future, does that assume disconnecting storm system and not having a combined? In, in conjunction with the membrane facility, the city also, it was about a hundred million dollar project to provide uh, uh, storage capacity in the sewer system itself. So a lot of storage tanks to um, uh, flatten the peaks, if you will, during some of these storms. A lot of Spokane, is, it's, a, it's a quick, high intensity storm and then it settles. And so if we can chop that in intensity curve down, um, we, we can make do with our storage at the facility. So that's also gonna buy us a lot of time. Come on, boys, you guys don't have any questions for me? <laughs> yeah. What was the project delivery method? Um, it was a CMAR. Yeah, right, Jeff. Yeah. CMAR. Yeah. Yeah. GCEM. Yeah. Depends on who you ask. You know the acronym. Yeah. So how did the startup go? I understand this is one of Paul's first six rack uh, systems instead of their conventional four. You know, six open cross instead of their conventional four. And the programming associated with the, the valve racks was different than they were used to. Did that go start seamlessly or? Yeah, I don't think, as far as the valves go, I think the thing that we had spent the most time was on the timings. I think they had a, uh, we spent weeks out there adjusting timings on each of the valves and they're all pneumatic. So a lot of these big um, vendor skids, Suez is the same way, they're all pneumatic valves. And so the opening and close times on those valves are pretty instantaneous. And when you're talking about large flows, it can cause a lot of flow disruption. So um, really tuning those down and making sure we didn't have these really large flow fluxes was um, something we spent a lot of time on. The flows surrounding the membrane modules, it's, it's a lot more than just in and out. Yep. There's, there's air, there's water, there's uh, various uh, back flushes, and there's a lot going on. And so the timing was, I'm sure, a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> So the, you put that little uh, box up there with the 30 operators and the training. Yep. Was that just the current staff or is that new staff or? That was our operational staff. Current staff. Yeah. yeah. That was one thing that got modified as we were um, starting the plan. Uh, the owner really wanted to have, make sure we had a lot of training, right? So part of it, we were limited by COVID. I mean, to, to say we weren't impacted by COVID would be, would be a lie. We, you know, we have the number of people we could have in the space, um, people's schedules, people being out sick. Um, so we, we really extended our, tra our running, training. Running three uh, shifts per 24 hours as well, trying to 
swap folks so that the graveyard was covered so they could come in during the day. Um, it represented a challenge which prolonged the training period more than what the project scheduled. So we, uh, a lot of adaptation to get that done. All right, so that is time. So uh, let's give another round of applause to Kirsten and Fred. Thank you.